My name is Scott Shefferman, and I'm the Senior Director of Global Services here at Silence. I've been here for about three years, and prior to that, about 17 years uh, in the DOD space, supporting what we call the uh, the warfighter. And um, you know, I've, I've been doing cybersecurity for about two decades, and uh, today I'm extremely happy to be able to introduce two of some of the best red teamers, pen testers, uh, hackers, for lack of a better word, that I've uh, had the pleasure of working with over those last 20 years. Um, and we're going to talk about the attack service, uh, why that's so important, what the value of doing a red teaming actually is at the end of the day, and how to make sure that you translate that value into actually getting stuff done that puts you into what we might call a state of prevention or a, uh, a posture of actual prevention rather than just doing a red team for the sake of doing it uh, or for the sake of compliance or other uh, drivers. Um, so without further ado, I'd love to introduce both Matt and Nicholas. Matt is our director of red teaming, and Nicholas has been on the team for quite a long time here at Silence as well, and they're going to have a wonderful uh, presentation for you today. So Matt, over to you. Thanks, Scott. Hi, everyone. Thanks for being here with us today. So Nicholas and I have a, uh, a presentation for you uh, around understanding and protecting the modern attack surface. So we're going to get into this and mandatory legal stuff. So as Scott said, I'm the practice director here for at Silence uh, in our professional services on our red team. And Nicholas is one of our senior consultants. Uh, together, you know, our team is responsible for uh, providing an offensive uh, adversarial perspective to our customers around um, both uh, network-based um, adversary simulation slash red team type of engagements, application security, that kind of stuff. It, it runs the gamut. And, and what we really want to do today is um, bring some of that perspective into uh, of the way that we target organizations, the way that we, we see uh, the posture of secure, the security of networks and applications and other systems um, to, to you guys and, and, and how you look at your own, your own organizations. So our roadmap for today, uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about how do we visualize an attack surface, uh, look at some definitions and, and try and apply that to some specific scenarios understanding and applying that attacker perspective, like I said, looking at ways that we can introduce some mitigations to, to shrink the graph when we're, when we're looking at and, and trying to evaluate what risks different aspects of our organization or different aspects of our uh, attack surface look like, and then trying to take a peek into the future of what we, we see as some interesting topics that will affect this going forward. So how do you visualize your organization's attack surface? Uh, I'm gonna pose this question up front because I want you guys to, to really think about, think about it. And it's gonna be the point of uh, the conversation here for a little bit. So do you see something that looks like this? I think that it's pretty natural and, and kind of a standard uh, approach or a standard mindset. It's an intuitive mindset to think of some sort of structure fortification where, where we have a a known set of things, inputs, area that we're trying to protect and, and maintain control over. So let's kind of try to apply that, right? So we're going to take our, one of my favorite fictional, uh, fictional technology companies. Uh, if you guys haven't watched Silicon Valley, um, Pied Piper is, is a reference to there. So we're going to do an exercise and map the attack surface uh, with that with that kind of mental model in mind. So the first thing we would do is try to define a boundary, right? We'd say, all right, well, this is our, our piece of the world. This is our footprint. This is what we need to protect. Based on that, we're gonna, we're gonna do some other things. So first, we could go through and identify the different components, the different component domains, knowledge areas that compose our organization. Right, so physical network application user, these are some. Um, I think they're, they're fairly, you know, there could be others depending on your industry, right? But I think these, these kind of give us a good foundation to start from. And if we're IT folks, maybe we don't care about the physical piece, right? Either that's somebody else's responsibility or what have you, it's not our world. We can't, we can't really directly affect it. So, you know, we're gonna build our defenses around pieces that we, we do control, we do own. Then we'll, we, we take 
you know, our, our piece of the world and we try and map it. Uh, maybe it's, you know, network diagrams, architecture, data flows, that kind of thing. And we, we get, you know, certain components. We have users, we have maybe some intellectual property, network devices, uh, laptops, desktops, servers, databases, uh, mobile devices, right? We can, we can kind of know that piece of the world. Uh, and, you know, then we look at, well, how is that stuff laid out? Maybe, you know, we've tried to structure our organization with a defense in depth type of posture. So we've got maybe a, a DMZ here towards the outside of the circle, and then maybe a, a more user centric area of the network in the middle and some secure data enclave server area where we, where we keep our secrets at the back. All right, well, we're talking about attack surface, right? So what does this have to do with that? Well, we've got this, this structure, right? And then we, you know, we think of attack surface in a way of what, where can somebody attack me? Where am I vulnerable? We look at that external boundary that we've defined, similar to that castle wall in the, the first picture. And we look for what are the weaknesses in that? So where, where are the vulnerabilities in our network? And we have this red section here that looks, that looks interesting. So maybe that's, that's our attack surface. That's where we know that we're vulnerable as an organization um, from the outside, looking at our, excuse me, our known footprint, our known boundary. But does this, does this model actually fit the world as we know it, um, the way that a modern enterprise works? I would argue that this model is a trap, right? It makes a lot of assumptions. It assumes that we, that we have a clean boundary around our organization, around our assets, what's ours and what's not. It assumes a relatively static state, right? Because we're mapping known components, known connections. It needs complete information to be relevant because we, we're, we're including that look at network topology and interconnections within our network. And that we account for known risks, right? So where, where are the vulnerabilities? That only gives us part of the picture. The reality of an organization is it's highly complex and variable and it's interdependent more with other people, things, organizations, partners, infrastructure, uh, than I think we appreciate on a, on a day-to-day -day basis, right? And because of that, there's a lot of obscurity in the, the actual state. Uh, there can be a lot of obscurity in the actual state of security when we, we try to look at a bigger picture, right? And we, we can kind of see that. If we, we try to map out the modern enterprise and say, well, what are the components? You know, there's the different security aspects, the, the tools that we introduce in the environment, the network, the endpoints, internal and external uh, servers, and then the modern enterprise is heavily dependent upon partners and cloud resources. So things that are truly outside of our control, they pose a bigger risk or have a bigger impact to the overall attack surface of our organization than I think most people understand. From a, as an offensive, Practitioner, I can't overestimate or over over emphasize the importance of uh, how indirect relationships between things affect the security, affect what's possible if you bring a, an attacker's mindset to to something. And, and then our users, right? They're they're probably the biggest variable, and I'm sure you all know that. Uh, but our the behavior of people has a far-reaching effect on how we can and can't secure uh, our organizations. So we need a better definition. Uh, so I'd like to point to some research that came out of Carnegie Mellon in 2008. There were some folks that did some quantifiable, they did some math uh, to try and develop a quantifiable way of determining, uh, determining a metric around attack surface, right? But, but what I wanna point to is this, this definition. Uh, a system's attack surface is the subset of the system's resources that an attacker can use to attack the system. I like this definition for a number of reasons. Um, it's broad enough that we can apply it to systems of varying types, right? A system being something that interacts or a, a dependent group of, of things, right? So you can look at an application system, you can look at a physical hardware system, or you can look at say an organization overall as a system in itself, right? That term resources, we need to know what they mean by that. So resources, uh, they compose resources of, of three different things, methods, channels, and data. The methods would be the available functionality 
in that system. So what can you get that system to do? The channels are the, the means of getting information or getting data into and out of that system. So how we communicate with it. And that data takes two forms, uh, direct, which are truly inputs and outputs of that system. If you think in terms of like a web application, right, they would be the, the requests that a user sends or a user's browser sends to, uh, to a server. And then the response is back. Or, you know, say uh, physically inputting a, a key into a lock, right? There's an there's a encoded combination or whatever on a, on a key in the way that it's cut. That's a form of data. And then indirect. Uh, so data that's, that's there, that may be about the system or a byproduct of the system in some way, but not directly involved in its, in its normal operation. So these could be you know, files on a file share, passwords on a user's, in a user's home directory, uh, could be somebody's post to social media, that kind of thing. The, these are elements or ways in which an attacker can, can influence a, a system and interact with it. Either, either getting information that would help them to help them to better understand or truly providing a means for them to, to influence its, its operation. So I'm going to hand it over to Nicholas now to talk a little bit more about what this looks like when we start to apply it more practically. I'm going to be discussing uh, the, starting with the application attack surface and the, uh, the different layers that uh, Matt described and go through a few of the specific uh, cases here and uh, discuss uh, why we, we kind of categorize them uh, here and where they might overlap. Um, so in, in the case of an application, you have to take in uh, all the different methods of interaction with that application. Is it a web app? What are all the functions that uh, it provides? What are its features? Does it have authentication and access control? Uh, does it have different user roles? What, where does the, the application live? Is it is on AWS? Is it uh, on someone's phone? Is it on their desktop? Uh, does it have multiple locations where it lives? Is it sandboxed? Uh, is it uh, internal only? Does it contain uh, proprietary data and otherwise? Additionally, you need to understand how it communicates, what its trust boundaries are, what information and how is it passed over the different medias that the uh, application be interacted with? Um, is there user suppliable data? Uh, how is that parsed? How is that uh, uh, examined and looked at? Are there uh, out-of-band communication channels uh, or third-party or hardware or physical uh, communication channels such as other input devices, wireless interfaces, uh, and otherwise, um, and as well as are there uh, documentary uh, reasons and support features built into this to allow for updates and controls uh, to introduce changes to the application. Finally, uh, what kind of data does it deal with? Is it sensitive information? Are there, is there, are there configuration files? Does it use a database to control data? And are there libraries uh, that it relies upon uh, that are shared with other applications? And uh, are, what kind of uh, storage uh, is being used for uh, different portions of the application sensitive data, if any? And there have been a number of abuses against applications, uh, I'm sure, that uh, have come up in the uh, past. Uh, we wanted to just talk about three here um, and, and discuss how they interact with the application's attack surface. The first one here uh, deals with how a developer interacts with a application's API. From, I believe, 2014 on, uh, there have been a number of uh, stories as well as uh, problems associated with uh, some of the data disclosures out of uh, one of the more popular social networks, uh, being Facebook, uh, including uh, applications being able to access specific data, um, including and not limited to uh, Cambridge Analytica uh, and third parties. Uh, even their, some of their competitors had favorable access at uh, some point to uh, the internal APIs uh, to gather additional data from the system millions of users, uh, at least in this case, were potentially had, th had their data gathered. Uh, it gave a huge amount of public uh, insight and uh, attention because of uh, its relation to several electoral uh, stories that were going on. Um, now I wanna talk about another one here that is a little bit less well-documented. Um, it is largely uh, dealing with how uh, different application frameworks use templating engines to display content. 
Um, there are a number of different engines out there used by application frameworks to display content. Um, and, and a lot of these have problems with how those templates interact with user supplied data as well as third party outside uh, applications that could be used to uh, change what those templates look like and then uh, change in, in effect how that application is interacted with by the user by either changing how the application appears, what is ap happening when the user interacts with it, as well as allowing for, uh, in some cases, even arbitrary code injection uh, into the application uh, on the server side as well. It, it was not given a huge amount of fanfare, but definitely could impact millions of different websites out there that make use of common templating engines. While these, these attacks are known out there uh, by people who are aware of how they work technically and some people who follow them, it does not gain nearly as much fanfare as some of the more public other attacks that have occurred. Um, I'd like to give you an example of another type. Uh, this is a uh, Node.js uh, dependency that simply all it did was shift code over so people could uh, move it, it would leave it left shifted the code. So all the code lined up. Uh, something you could do in a lot of uh, text editors with a couple of keystrokes, but uh, this did it automatically. Unfortunately, um, this became unavailable. Uh, and when that became unavailable, there were thousands of, of popular websites that broke because the dependency was no longer uh, available for them to use. And as a result, the Node.js uh, applications that were reliant upon it were no longer able to function. Additionally, other dependencies have actually been used uh, to introduce malware where a dependency user is hijacked or is orphaned and taken over by a third party and used in that effect to uh, introduce malicious code into websites and elsewhere that could be used to uh, attack users of those websites. Uh, the next uh, area we'd like to discuss is our endpoints. And this would be everything from uh, a user's desktop to a virtual desktop interface uh, instance that they, they access uh, internal resources from to a user's uh, company issued or a uh, personal phone where they've loaded uh, the, the company's email or messaging or some other software they're, they're used to, to do jobs with. Now, the, the same attack areas uh, appear here. We have things like uh, APIs that, that they use to call internally or externally uh, to interact with the operating system or other services elsewhere. Uh, often the endpoints have uh, default applications installed. Uh, for instance, on your phone, you'll have your browser, usually email client, messaging clients, and other features installed there. If it's from a third party vendor that doesn't use a, uh, a stock a uh, version of Android, for instance, you could have uh, skinning utilities, custom applications that can't be removed in, in some cases without uh, further compromising the device. Um, you have uh, security tools for BYOD devices or for endpoint protection on uh, corporate issued laptops. Uh, you have to worry about uh, things like uh, firmware from various hardware vendors, uh, as well as peripherals, uh, mice. Uh, there have been instances of keyboards having uh, injection possible on them. So there's a lot of different methods that which an endpoint is interacted with as well um, in both from the application side as well as on the endpoint itself with the other, the other uh, peripherals interactions that a user can do with it. The channels that they use are not too dissimilar from others. Um, they, they access network surfaces. Often they're web-based. In addition to those, there are also the physical interactions that can be made with it, as I said, with a keyboard, also with other peripherals, printers, um, cellular modems, um, other devices that are built in to provide uh, encryption to the devices, uh, key fobs, uh, USB drives, and, and, and any other number of tools that can be uh, interacted with on the system. Additionally, there's the user interactions that happen uh, through triple and normal usage, as well as any applications that they might be using. Uh, and beyond that, any data that is loaded onto the systems uh, uh, and uh, can be interacted with for things like uh, email and messaging. And beyond that, for, for the local system, you got to worry about the data that is stored on the device. So this could be anything from uh, key stores for credentials, bookmarks that have uh, internal URLs within them, uh, application packages that are issued by uh, corporate infrastructure or by vendors, um, system memory. So if multiple users share a given server 
or a uh, for VDI instances, for instance, or uh, the system is uh, using doing multiple applications at once, and uh, an, an application is able to read system memory and extract things like credentials, uh, SSL certificates, um, and other data from it. In addition, data in, in the form of, of what that, that user has downloaded and accessed uh, network service-wise in the form of email, network shares, and elsewhere. Uh, for remote files, Dropbox locations. All of these locations are, are, are potential attack services for the endpoint by introducing additional data, as well as allowing attackers to use other vulnerabilities to extract data from locations. And then finally, uh, we wanted to talk about uh, a couple of uh, instances here for the, uh, the endpoint. Last year, there was a discussion of how the Mac OS sandbox works, as well as some of the, uh, the mechanisms that could be used to circumvent the sandbox, uh, using side channel uh, instrumentation to gather alerts on when certain or all activities occurred upon the system. This allowed for uh, uh, applications that were sandboxed to receive alerts when operations that were completely outside of what that application should otherwise have access to we're able to alert and gather data from those alerts about other interactions, such as a web browser loading, or uh, an antivirus a scan commencing, or a user logging in, or any other uh, number of, of operations, uh, and to the point where they could leak sufficient information to gain ideas about how, what other applications they could attack, or any, even in some cases, user uh, what resources the user is making use of uh, it, it, from that, that operating system. Uh, a second instance of this was uh, is more recent. Uh, this is uh, using command line argument spoofing in order to uh, mask what commands are actually being issued. Uh, they can be done in memory uh, and be rewritten uh, after the uh, the original execution uh, in order to do things like uh, avoiding timed memory scans by uh, endpoint. Uh, and, and there are already tools out there that have been designed specifically to take advantage of this so that, say, when an endpoint uh, solution does a scan of memory looking for malicious activity, the malicious code has been changed in memory so it no longer appears as such and is reintroduced afterwards. And this is a significant issue, and uh, as, as of cur currently, I don't believe there is a way to actually uniformly address this issue. Uh, it's so recent. Uh, and finally, I wanted, we wanted to talk about... Uh, the user attack surface. Again, uh, we still have the three layers here, the methods, the channels, and the data. Now, the, the interesting thing about users is uh, they're, they're often people. A lot of the, the great thing about people is they are able to reason and uh, make, make judgments where computers often have difficulty. But on the other hand, uh, there are a lot of other interactive vectors with them that uh, incentives that have been given that uh, the other, the other uh, environments don't typically have. So for instance, physical interactions. Physical interactions can happen outside of uh, the interaction with, uh, at, with the endpoint or the application. Things like badges can be seen or otherwise from place to access physical locations or to access endpoints. They can be directed via social engineering to perform operations and commands on other systems. Additionally, they can make requests, uh, ask questions, and, and, and do other things that uh, a traditional system and other layers wouldn't be able to necessarily do. Uh, the channels that they use are anyone that uh, the five senses or more can allow them to do. Uh, Interphysical mail, for instance, mailing out CDs with, uh, with uh, malicious updates has happened several times in the past few years. Additionally, they may have relationships with others that can be used to gain trust with them. Uh, using social media. Uh, they can interact uh, interactively via the phone. So you can call them up, ask them a question, have them do something, see if the social engineering can work against them that way. In addition to that, they also have uh, digital communication mechanisms like email and messaging. So sending phishing emails and other, other things uh, is involved in that portion of the tech service. Uh, finally, the, the data that they use. They, users can be sloppy. They can store passwords easily on sticky notes or in local files. Uh, they can have mounted file shares uh, with, with uh, information uh, that's proprietary to institution. Uh, load onto it, or a dish excessive file access, which could allow once attacker gains access to the endpoint to move on into uh, another system and gain data. It has attached, uh, they have uh, attachments and messages through their interaction to see how, so an attacker could view emails, 
view messages and see how they interact with others in order to elicit other information or how to get them to do things by uh, impersonating a subordinate, someone who is their boss. Additionally, they may have additional knowledge on how the institution works, how business and operations flow works. So there's a good idea that they could uh, go and change things or tell someone, Tacker, what systems they need to, uh, to target better. So uh, once they get a foothold on the network, they see 50,000 systems. This may tell them what three systems they need to go after. Additionally, they may be issued corporate property, which can be lost, stolen, or misused uh, due to uh, improper user hygiene. Um, there are a couple of uh, recent examples here. Um, one is, is very recent, uh, where uh, a group uh, attributed to North Korea was providing uh, targeted ads to a uh, Chilean ATM service company. They were able to use that via one of the social networks for uh, job hunting to uh, set up a fake interview, which they had with the user over Skype, from that user's loca uh, employment location. Uh, this allowed them to gain a lot of information on how that the, the, the ATM servicing company functioned, as well as um, what systems they used, and as well as the institutional knowledge from the user. Uh, the user had, a, had an incentive in this case because they were seeking other employment. They were given uh, an attractive uh, a promise of an interview with a company that may have uh, furthered their career and gave up additional information. And while this, the, this information may have been gleaned from other things like social networks, uh, dealing with that sort of thing, it really speaks to what links attackers are able to go to in order to specifically target a, a company, which they're able to do using a number of different social networks, as well as uh, using that to extract information via an incentive and behavior that would not be abnormal for a lot of people looking to move to another position. Beyond that, we, we want to talk about general data disclosure. Uh, this has always been a problem. Uh, it crosses every industry. It happens when employees overshare information. Uh, they post pictures of their badges, questions about specific hardware and configuration settings to forums for technical support. They reuse credentials that are found in public dumps or uh, reuse credentials between sites that may have been compromised so an attacker can gather those credentials. Uh, it is, it's a big problem and it's, it's not something that's going away. Uh, and and in, in cases where this happens endemically, the security of that company and organization can be damaged in extreme manners uh, to, to have for, allow for theft of service, compromise of systems, abuse of people for additional data, and, and a, a whole host of other problems. Um, it, this is a significant issue with users. With that, I think I'm going to hand it back to you, Matt. Thank you. All right, cool. Thanks, Nicholas. So now that we have all of that, you know, additional perspective, we kind of understand a little bit more about what makes up an organization's attack, like what makes up the attack surface of a system and how we can better define it within this, these, how we can better outline it within this this definition how do we how do we then apply that so what does an attacker see right i would argue that an attacker sees something that looks more like this right uh the implication here is that there's a ton of interconnectivity and interdependency and changing attack possibility based on the context and privilege and trust that you give to either uh, a user, a computer, a, a group, a organization, a partner, um, both in and outside the organization, right? There was a, there's a quote uh, from, from John, La John Lambert. He is a, a security leader, security researcher at, at Microsoft. Defenders think in lists, attackers think in graphs. And, and while the rest of this, this quote talks about things from a particularly network perspective, where you know there are dependencies that, that create indirect relationships between assets or things in your environment that we can that an attacker can leverage. So it's not as much about the checklist approach, which I feel like fits into uh, the first model that we talked about of that defined boundary, that defined perimeter. I feel like those two things go hand in hand. It's it's much more about uh, looking at things 
as they are in practice versus what we've what we think they are uh, based on what we've what we intend them to be. So the the inner relationships here affect this graph as we saw previously, and it's if you if you think about it a little bit further, um, it's no wonder that we visualize an attack chain something like this, right? It's it's this recursive process of gathering information, looking at what's available, seeing the different uh, methods and channels and data that are available to us as an attacker recursively as we, as we target and work through, work through uh, a system, whether it's a network or an application or, or whatever. Uh, you know, the, the context of a, of a fully external user, of a, a fully external attacker it, targeting an organization or targeting an application is much different than one with, you know, with credentials to that application or with uh, an established foothold into the environment or, you know, uh, somebody who can physically walk in and plug something into the network. Really, when we think about modeling an attack surface, we should think of it as a, as a recursive threat modeling exercise where we take things step by step and we look at we look at the potential risks based on different levels of trust and different levels of access in our environment so we understand the full the full potential of the graph and not just look at what happens at a at a predefined boundary point so what we would pose is that the attack surface is the sum total of all means through which an organization interacts with its, with its environment and an attacker can interact with it. Uh, the environment being its physical environment, its logical environment from a network standpoint, its, uh, its partners, its supply chain, all of these things need to be taken into account when we, when we think about what feeds into an attack chain. And, and I feel like the definition that we've that we that we've got here um, really helps us get a better understanding and a better picture of what that what that really looks like. All right, so we've talked a lot about how we look at an attack chain, how we redefine, and we take a we take an attacker's perspective on it. So how do we start to get some control back? Because that's it's really important if we're going to secure anything. Like we need to we need to have a way of doing it. What I would contend is that whatever we do is always going to start with a strong foundation. Now, what we've got here are some concepts that uh, we had a little bit of fun with in, in restating them, because I think you guys will have, well, you, you all will have seen or experienced these in, in uh, more formal terms in your, your day to day. So don't trust, always verify. And you can apply this over any of the, the areas that we've talked about so far. An application, you can apply that to user input, right? Don't trust, always verify. For uh, authorization controls, both within a network, within an application, uh, within a building. Don't trust somebody by default, always verify. Don't trust the guy that walks in in the delivery person's uniform or in the maintenance person's uniform, verify their identity. Which feeds into our next one, you have to treat identity as sacred, right? Uh, it's it is incredibly important to have that sense of that, that ability for, of non-repudiation that somebody is who they, who they say they are and, and we can properly verify it. Uh, and, and that will allow us then to more accurately apply or accurately uh, divvy out the appropriate level of privilege to that person if we're, if we're confident in, in how we, the steps we've taken to identify them ensuring that we, we can identify someone and that we, we do so with the necessary level of rigor based on how much we trust them is, is a really important concept that we can apply across the board. Least privilege is another one, right? And that applies to uh, all facets, not allowing applications that you don't, uh, so not allowing applications to execute on, a, on an endpoint uh, that you don't trust, not allowing network traffic that you don't trust, not allowing privileged access that you don't trust, that you don't think is valid. Whitelisting approach to trust and to privilege, right? Need to know. 
taking steps to protect data everywhere that it is, uh, whether it's locked in a file cabinet or in a file on somebody's desktop or uh, passing back and forth between uh, cloud services or, or cloud infrastructure and, and users, users endpoints. We have to think about how we take the steps to properly secure that and, and make it put some robust protections around it so that we can ensure that it's safe. Building redundancy, having ways in which you can you can recover, you can you can have some some uh, uh, you can react if, if one control fails. So concept of two is one, one is none. If you have a single point point of failure. Uh, you, you're at risk of losing the ability to, to rely on that particular control. So minimizing, uh, minimizing our single points of failure. And this one I think is, uh, I really can't bound the, bang the drum on this enough. If it's broken, fix it. I, I wish I could say that, that the conditions are different, but we go into, we go into organization environments all the time where the basics like, Vulnerability management and patch management just just aren't applied across the board, and it's it's tough because you, you, that's one of the things that is core to to a lot of this stuff functioning. You know, it's it's about uh, taking care of the knowns, right? It, it, we, we can't take care of the unknowns if we don't first take care of the knowns. And there's a big there's a big piece of that from from known vulnerable software to outdated and out of support software. Um, Understanding dependencies is a huge one, and I hope that we've changed your perspective or, or opened your eyes to that here a little bit. Um, it's it's something that I think the offensive community has put forward a ton in the past the past couple of years. Um, in that there are these intrinsic or un inherited relationships between things where stuff depends on each other maybe in an unintended or not obvious ways uh, that have drastic consequences when it comes to the security posture of, of any system. Um, I'd point to Active Directory as a really good example of that. There's been a ton of research and a ton of time spent into applying this graphing, mapping, overlaying of dependent and inherited rights and relationships to show how an attack chain can, can play out um, based on what are otherwise unintended consequences of, of configurations or, or lack of lack of continued management or due diligence in, in, in configurations within a, within an active directory environment. That's kind of the, this, this approach that we're proposing to attack surface analysis is, is, uh, I think an extrapolation from that for me, at least taking this, this idea of unintended relationships or, or inherited rights and, and applying it. Uh, at a broader scale. And then testing, All right? Test early, test often. This ties back in with trust, don't trust and always verify. When you're putting security uh, controls in place in your environment, you're putting applications, you're deploying applications in the production, you're putting uh, endpoints and network appliances and, and uh, transitioning things to cloud services or bringing in a new partner. You need to be proactive about testing the assumptions that you're making around these different systems, these different, these different elements, these different objects that you're, that you're putting into your security boundary, that you're making part of your overall attack surface. Uh, and, and doing so proactively allows you to, to begin to understand these attack, the ramifications of their impact on your overall attack surface, and then start to be able to minimize that graph. Right, start to be able to shrink the graph. So that's what these, these mitigations, these foundations are built on. It's, it's really the difference between something that's sturdy, something that you can rely on, something that um, will allow us to build the structure of a, a strong organizational security, security program and, and a security presence to something that we have no idea when it's going to when it's going to fall over. Um, and, and usually it's when uh, we can least afford it to that, that things kind of come unraveled and unglued. So doing these foundational things allows us to then build on more, more advanced 
more effective, more robust controls, but we need that foundation first. So I'm going to turn it over back to Nicholas to talk specifically about some of these recommendations or mitigation. Thank you, Matt. Let's talk about some of the mitigations here uh, for applications. Uh, the first thing is here is understand your inventory of what your applications depend upon. This should be everything from uh, library dependencies that the application needs to run to the operating systems that they live upon, as well as the server, if you're running a specialized web server for it, uh, that it runs upon, and any third-party dependencies uh, from external sources. Uh, and that should be everything, including uh, the update uh, and patch management process is provided, uh, where those are hosted, and if they're using secure com uh, communications. Right? And then routinely checking to ensure that there is not a fallback or some change to, uh, to any of those dependencies. Um, secondly, if, if at all possible, uh, SSL uh, or some other encrypted transport mechanism, if, if, if possible. Uh, so uh, it, this is relatively cheap these days with uh, some of the free certificate authorities out there. Um, and uh, it, it's scriptable on most platforms to make it fairly easy to, uh, to set up. Um, then uh, again, strong authentication. Um, that means an authentication provider that meets all the best practices, if at all possible, um, has robust uh, reset, a password reset uh, or credential reset uh, capabilities and other features that uh, are best or, or, or close to best in class for uh, ensuring that uh, a user is who they say they are and that the credentials have not been hijacked, uh, if possible. Uh, finally, trust nothing. Assume everything is broke, is uh, untrusty, and begin from there. Uh, that means uh, checking your dependencies and make sure they're actually coming from where they say they are. Make, confirming that uh, uh, signatures on software are valid. Confirming that views, users are who they say they are. Um, using some sort of uh, mechanism to identify where uh, uh, anomalous behavior may be taking place from any portion of the application. And, uh, and, and above all else, proactively testing it before uh, deployment, if at all possible, and then continually testing it uh, using automated and, if possible, manual means later on. And and, and finally, uh, the simpler code is safer code. It tends to be uh, so the fewer dependencies you have to rely upon to get the application working properly, and the less code base that you have to rely on makes it easier to fix the bugs. Uh, this may not always the case due to sophistication of some applications, but uh, it usually is a, a better route, if possible. Uh, on, on endpoints, um, the infrastructure is really the, the important point here. Uh, can you support that endpoint and provide it with the security measures it needs, the updates, the configuration, automation, uh, and the enforcement, therefore? Uh, can you monitor to make sure that data is not being stolen, credentials are not being abused or otherwise, and make sure that the state of the endpoint, at least to the points, parts that you are charged with controlling, uh, is being enforced correctly, and if it is not having some sort of active defense to reconfigure uh, the thing so it matches the configuration, and using the, the proactive defenses to prevent hijacking of sessions uh, as well and in, of converging from the endpoint as well as the endpoint itself uh, any further than uh, is at all possible. Uh, that means uh, proper endpoint agents as well as monitoring of what uh, comes out of that endpoint. Uh, and finally, uh, application whiteband listing. If you can ensure what's there, you want to make sure that uh, the applications that you want running are the ones that are running and uh, you need to, before you allow others, you need to scrutinize them. So having whitelisting wherever possible is extremely helpful. And finally, any kind of patching needing, making sure that should be something that is adhered to patch management and update procedures for end of life software for replacement is extremely important there, be it software or hardware. Uh, finally, we're gonna talk about users. Uh, users, you need to interact with users. You need to make the, poly, the, the learning and the security controls you have something that the users are aware of and they also have some stake in, um, as well as something that you can, you can approach and understand sensibly so they make sense. The user knows why those policies are there and they also make sense to them why, why this fixes this problem wherever possible. Uh, providing good, robust training 
and uh, some form of way to make sure that the information was understood uh, by the user via some mechanism for testing, either be via testing action or by testing uh, via some sort of more formalized test mechanism. Uh, and incentivize good behavior. If a user is reporting spam or reporting phishing emails, uh, incentivize that. You have some sort of reward, uh, pizza party for everybody who sends a uh, spam in, gift cards, something that will make people feel like when they do the right thing, they report something or they say, I don't want to click this link, it seems suspicious, they're doing the right thing. And finally, have your security team or your, if, you're, if you are the security team, be a human, look like a person out there. When you have uh, uh, humanized yourself and humanize the policies, make the, sure they come from real people, uh, people you work with are much less likely to say, oh, they're just blocking me from doing my job. They're robots or they're, you know, they're policy monsters or whatever. When they actually see a real face on it, they're much more likely to say, oh, that person's working just to make ourselves, make a security better here. I can make their job a lot easier and everybody's job a lot easier if we just work with them. So. So this is the, the last piece I want to leave people with here on the, the mitigation part, right? So the big thing is don't assume. Uh, be aware of the conditions on the ground. That's what you need to manage to and protect, protect based on. Um, all the documentation, all the, the, the pre-work, all the, the policies, procedures, and everything uh, in the world isn't, isn't going to uh, protect against a drift or changes or insecure practices that are, that are in place on the ground that people are, are doing day to day or that are in your organization day to day, whether they're intended or not. Um, so the last thing that we'll spend some time on here is talking about the future a little bit. So we've talked, we've talked about some things that we think are important uh, in an organization's attack surface now, but how do we see that how do we really see that changing? I think there are a couple of big things that, that jump out. Um, the Beyond Corp, uh, this idea that the overall uh, security uh, posture, the security of an organization or the structure of an organization is, is going to be increasingly dependent upon other parties, uh, outside outside entities, outside systems, outside applications, I think is really important. Um, we see that now, but I think that that's only uh, going to be more and more prevalent in the, in the future. Uh, we, we've, we and those in the attacker community are, are certainly evolving our approach and our techniques to, to better be able to respond to, or, or better be able to target and, and model risks against these organizations that are much more uh, decentralized. Uh, adversarial machine learning, I think, is another big one. Uh, you'll see that there are some ups, upcoming uh, articles and, and, and content from, from some other folks here at Silence on this topic. But I think it's a really interesting one in, in two capacities. One, what is the application of machine learning or artificial intelligence going to do from a from an actual attacker's perspective, right? So how can we, we use it to be more efficient breakers? Uh, so you see things like uh, effective attacks against Google CAPTCHA, for example, where machine learning algorithms are able to, to do the image recognition piece and, and get past that, uh, that verification. But there's another side of it too, where, where we need to think about how we can attack and target machine learning and, and artificial intelligence systems um, as they become more and more critical to the functioning of our organizations and, and things in general, right? So we're talking about facial, like to take for example, you know, uh, uh, facial recognition technology, which we're gonna talk about biometrics too. It feeds into our last point about biometrics. Um, as that stuff gets more prevalent, are there ways in which these things can be regularly and routinely defeated? Um, I think, you know, it's, it's, there's some research out there about faking and, and getting around uh, image recognition technology where, you know, there are certain, certain subtle modifications that a person can't detect that, that you can make to images to have an algorithm consistently classify one thing as another. So taking that approach 
to a broader subset or broader spectrum of, of uh, machine learning or artificial intelligence based systems in the future, I think is going to be really important. Uh, and that, that goes into, you know, chatbots and assistants because they're, they're based somewhat on this technology. And those, those things are becoming more and more prevalent. I mean, I can tell you, I have, uh, personally, I have Alexa devices scattered about, scattered around my house. So it's, it's a thing where, uh, how those interact with our organizations, uh, is, is another piece that we need to consider going forward. And I don't think there's a solid answer around that. The same with the proliferation of, pr proliferation of unmanaged devices. So we talk, think, talk, think about Internet of Things or IoT. Those are already having an impact on our organizations, but that's only going to increase because we're, we are talking about, in a lot of cases, uh, as, as they are now, unmanaged endpoints uh, in an environment. I mean, I'm sure that none of you want to have your organization, uh, your organization hacked because, uh, you know, you put a smart light bulb in that was, that had an uh, insecure uh, wireless connection, right? And, and it happened to be, also be linked to your, to your wireless network. And then um, bio, biometric stuff, we, we talked about a little bit uh, in the context of the machine learning, but what is that biometric authentication or biometric data collection and capture going to look like um, in the future and how are we going to rely on it? It feeds back into both data protection and that identity, that strong identity component, uh, foundational component that we, that we want to stress so heavily. So, so these things I think are interesting, it's interesting potential, interesting topics. Uh, I think that the, the thing here is that the, the foundational stuff that we, that we espouse also applies uh, to these different pieces when we, when we place them into their necessary, um, their, their necessary buckets, right? So, so we have to be proactive about dealing with these, these types of evolutions and, and introductions of new technologies. And, and really, uh, to kind of close things out here, the point of this is really to, to kind of bring you that perspective of, of what we offer, what we, what we see in our, um, our operations within professional services dealing with our clients to help to push our customers more towards a, a, a posture of prevention. And I think understanding and, and having a proper or a, a more thorough understanding of what impacts an organization's or a system's attack surface is really important when understanding how to defend it, how to, how to implement the necessary controls and, and pieces um, to lower the overall risk, lower the overall susceptibility, lower the overall likelihood of attack. Uh, and that's what we want, right? We want to we want to get to the point where we're we're preventing these things as much as possible. Um, silence can play the can play a part in that, right? I think it's all about what the right tools are for the job, uh, what the right tools that fit into a particular system are. So, I will leave that at that. Um, I'm not sure if we have time for questions and answers. Uh, Shirley, I'll let you tell me if uh, if that's the case or not. Or what we're, we're at here. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Nicholas. Um, I know we are over in time, but if there are a couple of questions you want to answer um, or any frequently asked questions, uh, definitely do that. Thank you. Um, this is Nicholas. Uh, I think we had a few questions come in before the uh, webinar here. Uh, the first one is, what are your thoughts on using the MITRE ATT&CK framework to help blue teams evaluate gaps in their security controls? You want me to take that one, Nicholas? Sure. I get so I think the MITRE ATT&CK framework is a, uh, is a valuable tool, but I think it's something that has to be used in the, the appropriate context, right? So if we think about MITRE, it's, uh, the, the MITRE ATT&CK framework is this collection, this aggregation of uh, attacker techniques and, and um, specific tool, uh, not specific toolings, but, but true uh, tactics and techniques that we know of that have been 
employed by attackers through different phases as part of different attack chains and the overall uh, attack lifecycle, right? So understanding that it is a catalog of known, uh, known components, known techniques, known methods, um, we, need to, we need to take it as that. It's a, it's a starting point for an organization to evaluate their, their posture, their visibility, their, their detective, uh, their detective controls, um, but it's it is that it, it it is a starting point. It's a conversation starter. I think that it's uh, 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 relevant and it's very valuable when it's applied correctly. You know, it's it's never going to assume the the things that are going to come next. Uh, so so I, I I think that there's there's a lot of value to it, but it just needs to be pro applied the right way. Uh, next question. Uh, have you ever encountered security tools that have been left behind by other pen test teams? And I can go ahead and answer this one. Um, sure. We uh, discussed this before. I think we've all encountered this at some point. Um, sometimes it is a tool that they've used to access and give an endpoint uh, uh, and have not sufficiently cleaned up after. Other times it's because an artifact was left behind because something crashed and they were not aware of that and uh, it had to be uh, cleaned up. Um, Sometimes it is they distribute uh, software has been distributed out to systems that weren't aware of uh, because of other things that wasn't cleaned up or from. Um, I, we've seen these in, in a lot of different cases. That's what I'm saying. And uh, best practice is usually to clean up if, if at all possible um, and know every single endpoint and every single system that gets hit. Um, sometimes that's not entirely possible, um, but at least in 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 our practice, we try and clean up wherever possible and track everything that we touched. Uh, Definitely a big emphasis on accountability uh, from a from an offensive standpoint, right? So ensuring that both um, both we're properly cleaning up, properly being accountable, and putting proactive controls in place in, in the way that we uh, perform and 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 provide access to to our infrastructure, so that you know we can we can kind of prevent the distribution of some of these things beyond the scope of where we intend them to be. So. Yeah, and sometimes there are cases where it's not really feasible for us to clean up uh, off of a given system. For instance, if it is we achieve some sort of injection for code onto a system and we don't have the ability to go in and clean it up. In those cases, it's, it's always best to give as much information about where it might be, uh, what it is, and uh, what the best method would be for uh, whomever administers that system to, to clean it up uh, when that occurs. Right. Um, we have one more question here. What are the what are some of the best ways for someone starting out in pen testing to get up to speed quickly? So, this is a career question. It sounds like um, I can I can speak to it a little bit, and then I'm sure Matt has got his own ways of doing it. Um, sure. Read as read as much as you can. Find uh, look for blogs that are seem to be quality. People tend to reference frequently read them, uh, watch videos, set up your own virtual lab is extremely helpful. Um, go to conferences. There are, there are B-sides and other conferences all over. There's, I think at this point there's more conference time than there are days in the year. Um, and some are relatively cheap. Um, and if you're a student, some of them will allow you in for free. So uh, I would definitely suggest going to that, talking to people, see what they do, uh, get an idea of what you want to do too, because there are a lot of different even in, even in pen testing, they're different focuses. Um, so we, figuring out which ones you want to get into are uh, uh, really helpful um, and knowing what things you need to learn. Uh, a lot of it is people don't know what they need to learn. They see television movies or they might have had a, a few CS courses or even a basic security course, but there's a lot out there that you just need to know what, again, what the surface area of the, the that type of position would be. The only thing I'll add to that is um... From a, from a pen tester standpoint, I think the best thing that you can do for yourself is, is get yourself some, some demonstrable uh, experience or uh, in, in different ways, right? It can be uh, tool development, it can be uh, participation in the community, it can be uh, blogging, it can be something. Um, so, so taking your knowledge and trying to put it out there and uh, challenging yourself and, and not being not don't be held back by uh, a perception that oh well I, I don't know anything the only person you can, can compare your your development with in this field is 
is is yourself right there are people who've been doing it for a long time but that doesn't mean that that folks who are new uh, don't bring value uh, i think uh, figuring out uh you know, how to apply your your understanding of other things to uh, to an offensive um to an and having that offensive mindset so thinking about things in some of the ways that we, we started to allude to and then talk about here in this presentation is really important and if you can do that and you can you can try you can understand uh, technologies and the different implications of things i think you're you're in a good spot uh i think that is all except for there we have one more is this webinar only dedicated for hackers uh in my opinion, I think we should. It should be for everyone who's who's concerned about security. So, uh, uh, hopefully, everybody gets something out of it, and more than just the the hackers out there. For sure, I think it's it's you know trying to apply this this offensive mindset because you know when when we're going out there and breaking breaking organizations, breaking systems uh, every day, this is the way that we approach it, and, and we're relatively successful. So, I, I would like to think. So, you know, having this having this perspective is kind of is that know your enemy, uh, that know your enemy mantra. So if you want to be good at security or at, at defensive security, you need to understand the offensive side. If you want to be good at offensive security, uh, you also need to understand the defensive side. So that's, that's what we're hoping to bring to folks today. So well, thank, thank you, Scott, Matt, and Nicholas. I appreciate the insights here today. And thank you all for joining and spending joining us and spending time with us. Um, we I do want to promote our next webinar, which is on February seventh, and that's Science versus Hacking Exposed. Feel free to visit our website at science.com/webinars. In addition, we also have a library of on-demand webinars. We look forward to seeing you next time, and thank you for joining Science today. <laughs>